speaking to you about the book of Revelation uh, and suggesting a possible framework for interpretation. And that is just to treat the text honestly, just take it at face value, and just to, first of all, put it in its historical context. Uh, we need to consider the fact that John did not address this uh, letter to people in the distant future. He addressed his letter to people living in his day. Now, I'm not suggesting that it's not relevant to us 2,000 years after the fact or after the time in which it was written, but we need to consider the fact that uh, whatever relevance we might find in the book of Revelation, it had to have meaning to those people to whom it was first sent. Otherwise, it was false. Otherwise, it was deluding them. Otherwise, John was presenting them with something that was not true. When John told those first readers of the book of Revelation, the time is at hand, he meant to suggest to them and to say to them, the time is at hand. When he said the time is short, he meant to say to them, the time is short. Now, whether or not we uh, read it and apply something to our day is another thing, but it had, to be, it had to mean that to those first recipients or else it's a lie. Now, I don't believe it's a lie. I believe it meant exactly what it said to those first hearers and first readers. Now, what we were discussing in previous message is this. For what purpose was John writing the book of Revelation? Well, he was writing it to Christians living in the first century who were being persecuted, who were suffering terrible persecution, who were suffering not under the hands of the Romans. You see, the book of uh, Revelation uh, is, is written to people who were suffering in the first century. The first persecutors of the, of the Christians were not the Romans. The first, persecution, uh, the first persecutors of the Christians were the Jews. In fact, Paul himself, the great Apostle Paul, was one of those who persecuted Christians before his conversion. Uh, Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 2, They shall put you out of synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Uh, he said they will put you out of synagogues and they will kill you. Who will? Well, the people that put you out of the synagogues. Uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 9 says, But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in synagogues uh, you shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. Or a testimony against them. You know, this is not talking to you and me in our day. I've been to a Jewish synagogue and enjoyed a, a, a Jewish uh, synagogue service, and I have no expectation that anybody's ever going to drag me into the synagogue in our modern day and beat me. That's never going to happen. But it did happen uh, in, the, in the generation to whom this letter was written. It happened to the first Christians. In fact, you don't even have to go outside of the Bible. All you've got to do is read the book of Acts, and you can find several instances of people suffering exactly how Jesus predicted that they would suffer here. John is writing this letter to Christians who believe that Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but were suffering persecution. He uh, is writing to people who heard Jesus make a prophecy that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed by the armies of Rome and that its temple is going to be thrown down and not one stone left upon another. But then Jesus was resurrected and uh, after his crucifixion and went to sit at the right hand of God and they're still left here. They're suffering. They're being beaten in the synagogues just like Jesus said they would. They've been, they're being brought before councils and in the synagogues and they're being beaten by the Jews, by Paul and others like him before he was converted. And, and they're suffering all these things, and they would have naturally been tempted to give up. They, they would have naturally been tempted to, uh, to, uh, to say, well, maybe I was wrong about Jesus. So John is writing to encourage them that all the things that Jesus predicted were soon to come to pass. Don't give up. It's coming very soon, all the things that were predicted. So uh, we need to put it into that kind of a context. It was meaningful. It meant something to them. And as we read and look through this book of Revelation, in fact, in just a moment, I'm going to point out some things to you. It has direct connection to the first century, and it points to persecutors. First of all, the nation, the apostate nation of Israel, not the modern-day nation of Israel. This is not an anti-Semitic idea, but the apostate nation of Israel that crucified Jesus in the first century. Those were the first persecutors of the Christians. And then secondarily, on a larger scale, Nero's Rome, which was also a persecutor of the Christians. We're going to see both of those, the apostate nation of Israel and the... Uh, the Roman Empire under Nero, described in symbolic terms. Now that brings us to the second point of, of difficulty about the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is, I would say, obviously uh, written in signs and symbols. The symbolism in the book of Revelation is impossible to miss. The thing that helps us to understand or to interpret the symbolism of the book of Revelation is to realize that all of the symbols in the book of Revelation are drawn from the Old Testament. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, you will recognize all of the symbolism that's used in the, in, the, in the book of Revelation. It's all drawn from the Old Testament. And if you can look back at the Old Testament uh, predecessors of where this, these symbols are used, 
it'll help you to understand why the Apostle John is using them in the, in the book of Revelation. Uh, for instance, let me read you a passage from Revelation chapter 11. Um, in verse uh, 3 through 13, John describes two witnesses who were granted unique powers. Uh, Revelation 11.6 says that these have the power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over water to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now any reader of the Old Testament will immediately recognize in, in the language that John is using that this sounds a lot like Elijah whose prayers withheld rain for three and a half years and Moses who brought plagues on the land of Egypt. Uh, one of those was, uh, was to turn water to blood. Uh, Moses and Elijah, by the way, are the most prominent representatives of the two categories of the Old Testament. The Old Testament witnesses against Israel, that is the law and the prophets. So in this passage, Moses and Elijah are being described as witnesses. Uh, witnesses for, for what? Witnesses against Israel. See, this is about the judgment, first of all, on the persecutors of the Christians, the judgment on those who rejected Jesus. And so these two witnesses are describing Moses and Elijah representing symbolically the law and the prophet. They are witnesses in the sense that they are bringing witness against the apostate nation of Israel. Ultimately, in the person of Christ, whom was, uh, who was rejected and killed and finally resurrected and returned to heaven. Having rejected the law and the prophets and Christ, who is the ultimate fulfillment, uh, Christ whom the law and the prophets spoke of, having rejected Christ, uh, now Israel is spoken of in the language of final judgment by these two witnesses. Uh, Revelation 11 verse 8 says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now when we read these words, where also our Lord was crucified, we know that it's speaking in a veiled way, in a symbolic way of the city of Jerusalem. That's where our Lord was crucified. But notice it says that uh, their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of that great city, that is Jerusalem, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Now why, what does it mean when he says spiritually it's called Sodom and Egypt? Sodom and Egypt were recipients of God's judgment in the Old Testament. But now what's getting ready to happen is Israel is going to be rejected. Jerusalem is going to be judged. And Jerusalem now is going to be in the place of Sodom. Jerusalem now is going to be in the place of Egypt. Jerusalem is now spiritually Sodom and Egypt. The place where our Lord was crucified, speaking of Jerusalem. Um, Here's another, uh, and we'll talk about that passage more when we come to it. The message is clear. Israel is now under the same judgment that Sodom and Egypt were under. Let's look at another passage. Uh, this is Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book which was written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Now, I don't know about you, but I've heard many people speculate about what's this scroll? What is written in it? Sealed with seven seals. What's in this, this remarkable scroll in the hand of him seated on the throne? You know, the, the reality is we don't have to speculate. All we've got to do is read the Old Testament. This is a symbol drawn from the Old Testament. Here's where it comes from. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. It says, When I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, the roll of a book, uh, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. So when he says this scroll was written within and without, that comes directly from Ezekiel's prophecy, in which he saw a scroll. Well, what was it when Ezekiel saw it? Well, in chapter 2, verse 8, it says it's lamentations, mourning, and woe upon the rebellious house of Israel. So what is being said in the book of Revelation, it's a symbol drawn from the Old Testament, but what it means is he's describing the judgment of God upon Israel, the apostate Israel uh, that rejected Jesus, that rejected him in his role as fulfilling the law and the prophets. It's drawing all of, those, all of that symbolism from the Old Testament. So when we come to things that are perplexing, that we ponder about, that we wonder about, we just need to go back to the Old Testament and find out how it was originally used, and then we'll understand what its usage is meant to symbolize as it's used in the book of Revelation.